Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays. My name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. Today's special guest is Shell Hartzer and we're going to be talking about rodents today. Not just a disgusting pest, but a food safety issue. And what Shell doesn't know about pests, it's not worth knowing. So welcome Shell, nice, nice to have you along again today. How are you doing? I, I'm hanging in there. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Best day of the week. And uh, tell us where you're joining us from in the sidebar. North Shalina from Malaysia, Kwasim from KSA, Ethiopia, Jamel, Canada, everywhere. Where are you from, Shell? I am based outside of Atlanta, Georgia in the United States. Atlanta, Georgia. And the Olympics were in Atlanta, Georgia. When was that? 1990-something? Six? 1996? Yeah, I remember yeah. it well. And I, I'm, in, I, I'm in the UK, in Lancashire. Uh, I'm going to play the video ads now from our sponsors, and then we'll be back shortly for the presentation. Okay. The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. Everybody ready? Let's get this show on the road. Be back All later. Right. For, I'll be back later for the Q and A. I'll hand you over to show. Yeah, it's, it's, Simon's going to go get a cup of tea and you know his afternoon drink. So uh, happy to be here today. It's amazing. About 250 of you from all over the world. So thank you for tuning in. This is a this is a great honor to to be able to talk to people about something that that is really cool and yet at the same time a little gross and disgusting. Uh, so we are going to talk about rodents. Our rodents, uh, you know, number of different species out there, but the ones that we really focus on 
are the rats and the mice. Specifically with mice, it's usually house mouse. And with the rats, it's gonna be Norway rats and roof rats. Again, depending on where you are in the world, you may be dealing with some other rodents, uh, some other types of mice, other specific species of rats, but really worldwide, these are the three big ones, house mouse, roof rats, and Norway rats. So the problem with rodents, of course, is that they can contaminate our food. They can destroy our structures. Um, they, they are just absolutely destructive and they have had millennia of growing up with humans, of being in our space to adapt to what we have given them. All living things need food, water, and shelter. And that's exactly what we provide to these rodents. They are small. Okay, when you compare them to insects, of course, they're a lot bigger, but when you compare them to humans, they're pretty small and they like to hide. They're not out there going, here I am, I'm right here. They're hiding in those corners and those crevices underneath in those dark spaces behind pieces of equipment because that's where they're comfortable. That's where they feel safe. Again, they eat our food. We are providing them with a food source. And if you work in a food processing facility or a food storage facility, it's kind of hard to not have food. That is what you do. That is your job to have that there. So we have to find ways to prevent them from getting to that. And of course they can contaminate everything that they touch and everything that they walk by. Uh, rodents are notorious for leaving little droppings and little bits of urine everywhere they go. It's it's how they do it. They, they stop, they do their little thing, they keep going, they stop all over the place. And they reproduce pretty quickly. I'm not going to go into the, the basics of biology and what these look like and how many pups per litter there's going to be. There's lots of good information out there. Uh, there's information on the internet, there's good field guides, there's good experts that you can talk to if you want to learn more about that particular aspect. But I am going to talk a little bit about rodent biology and how it affects what we do. When we're talking about rodents, particularly in any type of food environment, we run the risk of those rodents eating that food, trying to get to that food. Again, the house mouse, the Norway rat, the roof rat have been living with us for millennia. They have learned to eat off of what we give them. So if it's there, they will often find it. Rodents will also affect, you know, the, the actual packaging to get into things, to get through that, that cardboard, wood, plastic wrap, whatever it is. They will chew through it to get into whatever it is that has that amazing food source inside that they want to get to. They cannot chew through metal. Um, so, you know, you'll, you'll hear stories of them chewing through concrete and chewing through metal and all this other, you know, impossibly hard stuff. That doesn't happen. But if there is that small little hole, they can get through to it. So they will expand little holes in things until they can squeeze their little bodies through it. And I'm going to I forgot to have a, a link up here uh, to uh, to give you in a little bit that you can you can see exactly what rodents do. Let's see if I can pull it up as I talk here. But oops, rodents will also. There we go. Rodents will also chew through structures. They'll chew through that packaging. And really what it means to, even if they haven't touched the food, even if they haven't chewed through that packaging, in the United States, our food co code says that, that even if that product is contaminated with rodent feces or droppings, or there's evidence around, say, a pallet of, of food products. That food is held in potentially insanitary conditions and that can't be sold. I have seen product rejected from, from shipments, large shipments of products that have been rejected because there's been rodent droppings on the outside of the plastic wrap that's wrapping that pallet. So rodents are really a problem even even when they're not touching the food and i have that one picture down in the bottom circled with that yellow circle because rodents will also chew through wiring so um there there's a statistic in the united states that says about 20 percent of fires that they cannot determine how it started they think are are done by rodents chewing on wires and creating that fire situation so this is a threat to your food product. This is a threat to your building. This is a threat to your suppliers who are, who are taking in your product once it's shipped. 
rodents can cost you a huge amount of money when it comes to this. And I really like this picture. Um, I did not take this picture, but you can see pretty much everything here. You can see the little bit at the bottom where it's chewed through the cardboard. You can see where it's chewed on the pasta. You can see where it's chewed through the bags. You can see the little droppings that it's left behind. You see those little pieces of plastic that it's chewed through and chewed up and spit out from one direction or another. This is a big problem. Not only have you lost this product, you've lost all the product around it because again of those insanitary conditions now that you have created by having that rodent issue. So you need to be aware of what this is, what to look out for, how to find these things when they happen so that you can find them when the problem is still small and, and maybe it's just one pallet of food instead of multiple or throughout your facility that these rodents are running and causing this damage. Because we wanna make sure this product gets to the end user in a safe way. And so you can sell it. This is lost money right here. We cannot sell this product anymore. And that's not a good thing. Additionally, we, we talk about rodents from a standpoint of disease, not just contaminating, not just eating our food, not just urinated, urinating and, and dropping feces all over the place. Rodents carry diseases that affect us as humans. So hantavirus is a big one, particularly in the United States. The plague, uh, the Black Plague that wiped out, what was it, half of Europe um, a few hundred years ago, the plague still exists. Uh, it is still carried. It is still found throughout the world. In the United States, we have an average of nine cases per year, human cases, which is, of course, very small. Other areas have a lot more. And if you look almost down at the bottom of this list, you'll see salmonella down there. Rodents can carry salmonella. And that, of course, is foodborne. And so this is a article from 2018 that was published. And they found that not only listeria, salmonella, but also E. coli and clostridium were transmitted to foods, to human foods by rodents. So compounding the fact that they're eating our food, compounding the fact that they're damaging our buildings, damaging the product, damaging the, the shipments, they are also potentially spreading these diseases. They can pick up little particles of, of infested material, they run through your facility, they drop them off in other places, spreading that all around. So not a good thing. Of course, uh, this is another article, this one, oh, I don't remember which year this was from and I didn't put it on there, but um, again, we, we now add, add toxoplasmosis to this, staphylococcus and the cl clostridium. And this is talking about the agricultural, um, the livestock environments, as well as urban environments, where we do food processing, where we do food storage. Think of restaurants, think of grocery stores, all of these places where rodents could possibly be and passing these nasty diseases around. I took this from the United States. Uh, this is from 2018. This was the most recent one that I could find for a shutdown and an actual full shutdown due to rodents. So this is a possibility that if you have rodents and the problem is bad, you could be shut down. Now, again, this is just for the United States that, that our Food and Drug Administration uh, can do this. Other countries have different rules, different regulations, but it is a possibility that a food facility could be shut down because of this. And you'll notice on that, that headline, unsanitary facility conditions. That is rodents, pooping and peeing all over the place and destroying food. Um, I'm sure there was some other stuff going on here as well because rodents don't just come into a facility that's nice and clean and perfect. They come into facilities that have that available availability of food, water, and shelter. So again, this is from a, a couple years ago, but a very good possibility that that can happen. Uh, this is, <laughs> I had to take one from my own backyard, and this is very recent. This is from July of this year. 
uh, viral video, and I have it circled there because in this picture it is a little bit hard to see, but if you actually watch the video, you can see the mice. I'm assuming it's mice. It looks, looks more like mice than rats. Uh, you can see the mice running. Uh, this video clearly shows that. So not only do you have uh, potential audit violations, that you have that federal aspect that the government can potentially come in and shut you down you may have suppliers and vendors that start rejecting your product because of contamination. And even worse is the public perception. If your company gets on the news that says, and, and I have it right here, this is the American Deli Company, uh, they're on the news now. So how many people are going to want to buy their food because they know that they have rodent issues now? So you have public perception that comes into this as well that can really affect your bottom line. As I said, this is this is actually my state. This is uh, Georgia and the United States from July of this year. Forced to close. So all that is very interesting. All that is fun. Um, it's great to know that rodents carry salmonella and listeria. But what are we actually going to do about it? This is the key now. This this is the fun part. Prevention is key. Uh, and that's really easy to say, just keep them on the outside, don't let them in the building. But it's a lot harder to actually implement. So anyone who stands up here and goes, pest control is easy, they're, they're lying. <laughs> I, I wish I could say this was easy. I wish I could give you a, a magic wand and you could wave your magic wand and all your problems would go away. It's not that easy. So what we need to do is look at the inspections. Where are we looking? How are we looking? What are we looking for when we're looking for rodents? As I mentioned, food, water, and shelter. Those are our things that our animals are going for. The rodents are going for food, water, and shelter. So how do we clean those things up? How do we reduce those things? Particularly when we are producing a food product, you can't get rid of that. So how do we make it less appealing? How do we how do we prevent this? Looking at exclusion, looking at trying to keep them on the outside of the building. Outside, they're okay. We still don't quite want them there, but it's a lot better than having them inside. We also have to look at how we monitor so that our monitoring systems can give us that early warning of when things start to change, when we start to get something inside, when those outside populations start to build up and we have more risk of them getting in. So monitoring is increasingly important with rodent control. So let's start with inspection. Inspection, I, again, I like to joke that inspection is easy. All you have to do is look at everything and look at it all the time. That's really challenging, particularly because for many of you, this is not your job. You're in a different position. You may oversee the pest control program. You may have some impact on it. Uh, you may, you know, you may actually do some of the pest control, but even if you do, you can't possibly look at everything all the time. You are one person. So we have to look at key areas and we have to try and focus where we know that issues could pop up where rodents are likely to be. So we want to look both inside and outside. This is important because many of our rodent problems, those Norway rats, those roof rats, even the house mice, start on the outside and those populations build up and your food facility looks really appealing to them because there's a lot more food inside than there is outside for those populations. So if we can start looking on the outside, start identifying those areas, we can start the control out there so fewer and fewer of them are able to come in. So when we do an inspection, we want to look for the rodents themselves. Uh, if you go back to that, that picture I had of, of that American deli, somebody saw rodents running. Now, by that time, you probably have more than a few. Um, it is hard to see these. Again, they are small, they are sneaky, they want to hide from you. You are big and scary as a human being. They want to avoid that. And these are mostly nocturnal, so they are going to be more active at night in general. If there are huge populations, you will see these running during the day, and that usually indicates a very big problem. So look for the rodents themselves. If you see them, you have a good indication that you have a rodent problem. But there are other things to look for too. We wanna look for the, the gnawing, those, those little teeth marks as they chew through packaging, as they chew through wood to get into your facility. You wanna look for the droppings. The droppings are small, but 
so are the runes and the droppings don't move. So you can see where they are. You can see the pathways that they're using, see how they're running and looking for the food, water and shelter that they are looking for. Identify that, we can identify those key areas. Uh, these, these first two pictures here, uh, on the left and in the middle are pictures that I took. Uh, the first one is of droppings and I have a pen there for size reference. And this is uh, in a facility, you can kind of see the product on the floor. There's some spilled rice there. There's lots of droppings. So these rodents have found the rice. They have gotten into the packaging. They are very happy in there. This rice had actually been in this warehouse for I think over six months. That is a long time for a food product to sit there. So as you look at the products that are in your facility, what has been there for a really long time? You know, what has been there for three months, six months, nine months, the longer a product sits, the longer it stays there, the more chance of it being invested. So remember those first in, first out procedures. If something came in first, use it first. Use the oldest stuff first, get it out, switch it out with that newer stuff. Uh, the picture in the middle, this is great because you can see those little chew marks. The, the hole just wasn't quite big enough for that rodent to get through. So it took its little teeth and it expanded that hole until it was big enough for that rodent to get through. You can see some droppings around that as well. So we're looking for these chew marks, the droppings, the evidence that a rodent has been there because that rodent is probably in the subfloor right now, if I remember where I took this picture. And they're not going to come out until the evening when everything's quiet and all the employees have gone home. So you're not actually going to see that rodent, but you're going to see the evidence it's left behind and you know where it's going. Last picture I did not take, but those small openings. When you're looking around to try and prevent rodents, you want to look for any opening that a rodent can get through. And I am going to see if I can drop a YouTube link in the chat box here. Um, for you folks to go and watch this later. If you think that rodents can't get through a pretty small hole, they can get through a very small hole. So when you look around your facility, look for all those small openings that rodents can potentially get through. When we're talking about inspecting, we're also talking about looking for that food aspect. The water for rodents uh, is predominantly for the rats. House mouse can actually go their entire life without a source of drinking water. They can actually get all the water they need from the food that they're eating. However, if there is a source of water, they are going to take advantage of that. And this is habitat as well. So when we look for what we call those conducive conditions, we're looking for conditions that provide food, water, or shelter, or in this case, all three. There is an adequate food supply. These rows don't have to work hard at all to get to all this spilled grain, even the grain in the sacks. And there's plenty of water for them to feast on. They're probably living in between those sacks because it's a great place for them. It's nice and safe in there. This is, this is rodent heaven right here for them. That was outside. We also have to look inside. Inside, we are processing food, so that should be fairly well sealed up. We've got that in the equipment. We've got that in packaging. We've got that wrapped up on pallets. But what about all the spilled food? What about all the waste? What about your kitchens? What about your employee areas? This is actually in a food processing facility, but this is in the employee break room. This is in the kitchen. Okay, so this may not be out on the production floor, but if there's rodents inside the facility at all, they can easily go from this break room into the processing area. So looking underneath things, looking behind things, looking honestly for those gross, disgusting areas that haven't been cleaned in a while. Again, plenty of food source here. There's probably a water source behind that leaking pipe, uh, probably a water source in, inside that, that drain there. And of course, this is underneath an area, so it's nice and safe and dark for them. You also wanna look for warmth too. Anytime you have a motor on anything, uh, that, that extra bit of warmth, they really like that. And it's the motor's usually in the back and underneath, so it's a nice, safe place too. When we talk about sanitation, we're also talking about habitat reduction. 
So this is a, a facility, and, and I hope <laughs> I hope this is none of your facilities. You can see that that vegetation is really heavy. This is perfect because predators can't get in here, so the rodents will burrow under that. It's nice. Nobody goes back there because it's all overgrown, so nothing disturbs them. So this is rodent homes. This is the burrows for those Norway rats. There's some bigger trees here that could potentially have roof rat nests up in the tree limbs. So looking around your facility on the outside, making sure you have that vegetation free border so that it's not safe for the rodents. Think like a rodent, you're, you're a small mammal. You wanna be safe, you wanna be tucked in, you wanna be in a nice cozy little area that's dark and warm. Any of these spots on the outside of your facility, if you can cut these spots down some, remove some of that vegetation, you've removed that habitat and probably a lot of food source. There, there's probably nuts and berries and all kinds of good stuff out there too that's supporting those populations. So as I said with inspection, don't just look inside, you have to look outside as well to find these conditions. If we can stop these conditions on the outside, we move those rodents just a little bit farther away from the facility. We, we encourage them to go elsewhere and they find a better place with better food, better shelter, that's not right up next to your facility. So they can't get inside that door. They can't duck inside the open dock door. This prevents them from, from being there. Uh, this is a picture I took. Um, this is a brewery, actually, and pretty much any facility, any food facility, any storage facility that I've ever gone to has some type of graveyard. I call them graveyards because they're this, they're this one place that sort of everything gets dumped in that they don't need. So old pallets, old machinery, old packaging, whatever it is, there's this graveyard that they kind of put it in this area because they didn't quite want to throw it out, but it hasn't been used in forever. And remember what I said about those food products, if that food product sits there for six months, nine months, whatever it is, it becomes more and more chance of it being infested. Same thing with these graveyards. Even though there may not be a food source there, these pallets were clean. There was no food source. Um, again, this was a brewery, so there, there was nothing there for them to eat on these pallets. However, these pallets were right next to their dock. So you had trucks coming in and out with goods, you had doors opening and closing, and this is great habitat because it hasn't been disturbed in about a year. Those pallets were set out there, they thought they were gonna use them. It's now lots of rain and wind and, and sun and weather, but they're protected in there because it's nice and safe. So look for your graveyards, and graveyards may be inside or outside or both these areas that haven't been touched in a while. Those are prime areas to inspect, to make sure that there's no evidence of rodents, and if there are, to really focus on those areas. So again, conducive conditions, those conditions that we're looking for. Uh, this, this is inside now, we've got inside a facility, I won't tell you what they were doing here, um, but this, this looked like this all the time. This wasn't just a one-time thing that this was one day, they consistently had these piles of cardboard, piles of, and it was empty cardboard, there's no food source in here. However, the next shelf over, you can just kind of see the shelf in the, in the upper left-hand corner, that's where food was stored. So it was very easy for those rodents to set up their homes, set up their, their nests inside all this messy cardboard and take a quick little trip across the floor and up that shelf to where the food product actually was. Look for these messy areas, the overgrown, the overgrowth, the, the, the mess that is there, the graveyards. These are going to be prime areas that if rodents are not currently in, they may get in. You may not be able to clean this up overnight, but you can start monitoring this area very closely as you clean it up so that if something does get in, you can find it very quickly and address that problem. Now, ideally we want this cleaned up. Ideally we want this cleaned up. Ideally we want all of this vegetation gone. It's not always possible to do that right away. So put on the list to get done, make an effort to get it done, to have somebody clean this up, 
to make the mess go away. In the meantime, you know that this is a potential source and you can start looking at it much more closely and focusing on these areas. Uh, if you're in the United States, you've been in a food facility, um, inevitably this, this first picture here with the door propped open, I've seen it. I've seen it in almost every facility I've been in. Somebody props the door open just, just for a minute. It's okay. I'm just going to go outside for just a minute. Um, the, every time a door is propped open for any longer than it takes a person to walk in and walk out, a rodent can easily run through that door. Even with that little box there, you can see the daylight. You can see all those spaces where it can go in. And what you don't see is right outside this doorway is also a very big dumpster. What's a dumpster? Dumpster is a food source, a water source, and a shelter for rodents. So you have that, you have that outside, which is good, you know, but you're leaving the door wide open for rodents to literally run into your site. So watch your doors, watch your employees, make sure your employees uh, of the site know the importance of keeping these doors shut because it's not just rodents, it's insects too. We're focusing on rodents, of course, for this, but insects will easily get into that wide open door. Check your dock doors. The second picture here on the right is a dock door that just doesn't close fully. And that is more than enough space. Again, go to that YouTube link and, and check that out once we're, we're done with this presentation and take a look at that, how small an area that road needs to get in. And if you'll notice too, we actually do have a, a road bait station just to the right over here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I am circling it. Uh, there's a road station there, which is great because maybe they know that this door, it can't fully shut. They're working on it, but they know they can't fix it today. So they've put a monitoring device there. They've put a control device there just in case something gets in until they can fix that door. I'm assuming that's the case. We'll, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt on that one. Don't forget to look up. When we talk about rodents, we talk about those little things that are crawling around on the ground, that little mouse, but roof rats prefer to be up high. And we forget to look up. We forget to look at all those openings that are up high, those vents, those air handling units, anything like that, that isn't screened, that doesn't have a, a seal on it. Make sure that those are sealed so that the roof rats do not get in that way. I've actually seen Norway rats climb too. I've seen Norway rats up high. It doesn't happen as often, but if you are in an area with roof rats, this is a very big issue. Get up on the roof every so often. Look up there. Look up from inside the facility. If you look up, you can see daylight coming in and there is no screen on that fan. So if that fan blade isn't running, roof rats can easily come down walk on those pipes and get down to where a food source is. I did drop uh, one of the links in there. I'll see if I can't quickly find before, <laughs> before I finish this presentation and the other link, but look for these small holes. In the United States, we like to say that, that the mice can get in the, the size, something the size of a dime. Uh, for a full grown rat, about the size of a quarter is all the space that they need to squeeze their little bodies into a facility. So think of that, think of walking around your site and how many openings fit either this dime size or this quarter size opening that a rodent can potentially get in. Start sealing those up, start, start making sure that those are sealed off so that rodents can't get in. And when you do that sealing, when you do that exclusion work, um, please do it well. Uh, a rodent will easily eat through this foam, and I, I think those might be sweatpants that somebody has tried to shove into that hole. Try and fix these issues with really high quality goods. Otherwise, the rodents will just chew through them. Now, I'm going to give the first picture the benefit of the doubt there that it was just something they did overnight because they were going to come back the next day and do it the right way, like it's on the right picture. However, I have seen this happen. Now, the one thing you can do is if you're not sure, if you have a lot of openings and you're not sure if rodents are using those openings uh, and you're gonna prioritize which ones to fix first, you know that it may take you a couple weeks or a couple months, you can stick some newspaper in those holes. If you come back the next day and that newspaper has been pushed out, you know that rodents are using that particular entryway. So you can seal up those openings first, but try to do this with high quality, permanent materials. 
Um, that is really going to be your best bet. Otherwise, they will chew through it. Quick story here. Uh, I was working in a facility, and again, this this uh, was actually on the docks. They had a small office for their truck drivers to come in and use the facilities and heat up a meal real quick. And they had some office staff in there as well. And they were having a mouse problem. Well, turns out the mice were living in the back of this small little fridge. There was a little motor in the back. Uh, there was enough opening for them to get in. And there was a happy family of about 20 mice in the back of this small little refrigerator. They had food nearby because the office workers, the truckers were using that and the trash didn't get taken out as often as it probably should have. There was water because there was a water fountain there. We have the habitat because it's nice and closed in at the back that they had just enough room that they could, it actually chewed out most of the insulation on the back of this refrigerator. So plenty of room for them. We took that whole fridge outside, uh, bought bought a new fridge and really eliminated this, this problem just by taking out the fridge. But we had to find it and we did, we traced back to where it might've been. So you've done your inspections, you've looked on the inside, you've looked on the outside, you've looked for all of those conducive conditions, all of the sanitation issues, whether that's food or shelter or even water. You've looked for the points that you need to seal up to keep them on the outside so that they don't come in on the inside. We also have a lot of employees at your sites. There's a lot of people that work there. Why not use their eyes? A lot of times they know what's going on. They've seen, you go back to that, that video of, of the mouse, that, that was a security guard that took that video of that mouse in the American Deli uh, uh, restaurant, or sorry, food facility. So people see this stuff, but do they know who to tell? I've been in a lot of situations where the employees on, on the front line, the employees that are, are doing the, the work, the packaging, the manufacturing, they know and they, they, they can point me right in the right direction. Oh yeah, I saw that over there. But they've seen it for months, but they've never actually told anybody because nobody's told them to tell somebody. So make sure all the employees at the facility know what to look for. Know that if they do see something, they should tell somebody so that the pest control team can look at that. They can go to those areas. They can solve that problem quickly when it's just one or two little rodents instead of months later when they've reproduced and now it's hundreds of little rodents that are running over there. So do the employees at the facility, do they know who to tell? Do they know what to look for? And getting that message to whoever does the pest control. You may hire an outside company to do your pest control. You may have an internal team, but that message has to get to them so they can do something about it. They can inspect those areas. They can find out why it came in. They can find out what it may be feeding on and fix those underlying conditions. That is key, not just seeing it, but doing something about it. I've said this a couple times that you are producing food, uh, you are storing foods. So how do we clean that up? You can't. Uh, you have to produce that food. That is your job. That is your your facility's you know main purpose. So what we're looking at is trying to minimize it. We don't want this overflowing situation. We don't want lots of debris on the floor. We want to clean up everything that we possibly can, and we want to seal up everything that we possibly can. But it isn't, it isn't possible to do this perfectly. So we have to be aware of what's going on. So what we do is we use those bait stations, we use traps, and you have your pest control company. Again, maybe that's an outside company that you hire, maybe that's an internal team that you have that deals directly with these pest issues. When it comes to rodents, we'll have those lines of stations on the outside to help reduce the population. We'll have some stations on the inside that will help if anything does get in. And these are monitoring devices as well. I should say I have a bunch of pictures in here of different devices. I, I don't have a particular recommendation on, on which device you wanna use. There are a number of models, there are a number of different manufacturers of these devices. I'm not saying that one is any better than another. Uh, so in the United States, we typically use rodenticide bait. I know if you're in Europe, this is a different situation and you aren't allowed to use rodenticides as much as we can here in the US. So 
realize that as I talk about these bait stations, this is from a United States perspective, and I know some other countries do have do have some regulations in place when it comes to that. But you can also have non-toxic bait on the outside, or maybe traps in these on the outside. And what this does is we can start to see if we look at these, say, every week or every two weeks, how much bait is being eaten? Is it just a little bit that we may just have a small problem on the outside? Or is all of that bait consumed and we have a lot of rats on the outside then that we have to think about. So we can start to monitor those populations by looking at the bait. From your perspective at your facilities, particularly since I know that most of you aren't actually doing the pest control activities themselves, look at these things on the outside. The picture on the left here that I have that kind of funky little yellow arrow, that station isn't set up right. You can see that the hole is in the wrong place. Remember that the rodents are small, they're scared, they wanna, they wanna run up against those walls. That's a safe spot, that, that floor wall junction, because they're protected there. They've got at least one side that a predator can't get them from. So if you have those holes moved around, they're never even gonna go, go, go into that bait station. Okay? They're gonna go right by it on the other side, and that station is now pretty ineffective. So the picture on the right shows how it should be set up with those holes up against the wall. So as you walk around the outside of your facility and you notice these things, if one of them is kind of kind of offset a little bit, the holes aren't lined up, it's not pushed flush up against that wall, go ahead and push it up against the wall. Okay, put it back where it belongs because some, the, maybe you know the gardeners moved it out of the way or maybe somebody accidentally kicked it and moved it. Just put it back. And Brenda, a good point about non-toxic bait. Um, you know, you are feeding the rodents, let, let's be honest, and that's something that we don't necessarily want to do. But if you're using non-toxic bait and you're using it to monitor to see, it, is it increasing or decreasing on that food level? And then you add more traps. So um, that's, that's a very valid point that you may want to think about whether you use a non-toxic bait or whether you use more traps. And that leads, of course, right into traps. Thank you, Brenda. Perfect segue. So we can use traps on the outside, um, but typically we're going to use the majority of our traps on the inside. So these, it can be a, a single catch, like a snap trap, or it may be one of these multi-catch, these kind of like tin boxes that you might see. These are often called tin cat style traps, um, but this one can, can get multiple mice in there. But look at those openings too. Okay. When you have snap traps, these bigger snap traps are good for rats. These smaller tin cat style traps really aren't great for rats. Rats are too big to get in there. Even though they can fit into some pretty small holes, this is more designed for mice. So what problem do you have? What's your major issue at your site? As I mentioned with bait stations, that they can be set up a little incorrectly. They can be knocked out of place. Uh, my picture on the left here is a picture of a trap that is not going to work very well. Number one, it is not flush up against the wall. So that run is just going to run the wall and it's going to run right behind the trap. Uh, you can also see that it's sort of kind of damaged. It looks like a forklift ran over it or something. So even if a rodent does get into that little trap, it can easily just push the lid up and get right back out. So for you folks who aren't doing the pest control, look around your facility. Do you see any of these traps that need to be pushed back up against the wall that are damaged that you need to let your pest control team know that they have to bring a new one that's not damaged? Okay? People sweep the floor, you wanna clean, these things get moved out of place a little bit. Push them back up against the wall. And let your employees know too, let everybody at the site know, hey, the reason why we have these pushed up against the wall is because that's where the rodent's running. You can see my picture on the right here. That's exactly what we want to happen. That little mouse is gonna run the wall. It's gonna run that floor wall junction because that's where it feels safe and secure. It's gonna run right into that trap, which is exactly what we want. So take a look as you're doing your inspections, take a look as you're doing your normal job. You know, glance out of the corner of your eye at all these devices, okay? And make sure that they're set where they need to be set. I haven't talked about glue boards. Again, different countries do have different rules about this. Uh, again, I know in Europe, uh, using glue boards is a bit of an issue. Uh, in the United States, we do use quite a few glue boards. 
Glue boards can be effective at catching mice. Glue boards are not effective at catching rats. They're just too big. I would caution you when you, if if you are in a in a country that can use glue boards, of course, if it is not against your regulations, uh, be very careful how you set these. Glue boards can catch anything. And we want to avoid catching non-target organisms. And glue boards can be easily moved. Somebody can step on them and get stuck to the bottom of their shoe. Uh, so be cautious if you're using glue boards and make sure you place them very carefully so that they catch what you need it to catch. And once it's done, remove those glue boards. Pest control is a partnership. As I mentioned, how many sets of eyes do you have in your facility? How many employees work there? Everybody from management down to your frontline employees. Everybody can be looking for this as they're doing their jobs. They don't have to stop. They don't have to you know, be responsible for the actual inspection, but you have so many eyes there. Why not use them? Why not tell people, hey, if you see something like this, this is the person you tell. And that information gets to your pest control team very quickly and they can solve that problem when it's still just one or two little mice, one or two little rats that are running around before it gets out of control and you're losing lots of money from damaged product, infested areas, and your suppliers and your vendors aren't happy with you either. So everybody really has a role to play. All you need to do is point out a couple little things to look for. Look for the rodent. If you see these little droppings, if you see these little gnaw marks, if you see a door that's not shutting, any of these things are easy to report and often fairly easy to, to fix. You have a pest control a team, whether that's an in-house team or whether you hire out a contractor to do that, but they're only there for maybe one day a week, maybe one day every two weeks, depending on how often. So everybody's eyes can be really important to you know, push that team in exactly the right direction that they need to go. And don't forget about your contractors, okay? You have other people that come in and out of your site. I will say we've got, I'll, I'll finish up here in just a minute because I know there's gonna be a few questions, but um, I do wanna tell one more story here as we go through. We also wanna document everything. This is really important for your audit standards. If you're following a third party audit like SQF, BRC, any of those, you may have to follow federal standards depending on what you're producing, where you're located, and also you wanna solve your problems. So my last little story here, this happened in a food processing facility. And you can see by this graph that all of a sudden we're starting to get more mouse problems. Now this is a little bit simplified. Um, there were numerous traps that were out, but this was, this was only like about two or three traps that were starting to get hit. And all of a sudden we see those numbers spike. There had been no issues prior to this. So what, what do we see happening? I mean, what's going on here? Well, what started to happen is that their gardening team was not exactly paying attention to this one side of the building. So you remember that one picture I showed you with all the vines going up the side of the building? That's, that's similar to what this side started to look like. And those rodents had started to burrow in those areas and they started to use that area. And the door was being propped open actually by an outside contractor. It was a, a maintenance person for one of the pieces of equipment. And he was there for about a week and he was propping the door open every time he went out, which was allowing the mice to come in. The pest control person didn't document this either. Every time the, the, the mouse ran in, they'd take it out of the trap, they'd dispose of it, but they didn't tell anybody and they didn't start looking for those issues, that open door. So it got to a point where they were seeing mice running in and out of the building. Um, and when we finally figured it out, we figured out we needed to close that door. We sealed up that door really well and we got the maintenance crew to make sure that they cut back all of the vegetation. And once we did that, those numbers went down. So you also have to look at what these numbers are and what they're telling you, because this is a story right here. So if you look at the story, you can also look at, you know, what it's telling you and how you need to go about fixing this. Again, this was just about three traps out of maybe a hundred in this facility. So we didn't have to pay attention to these 97 that were over here. We just had to pay attention to these three and this area. There's something going on in this particular area. And this is what's causing the problem. So it helped to focus those inspections. It helped to focus on where the problem was gonna be so that we could 
very quickly, very effectively solve that problem. So remember that everybody is involved in this. Everybody has a set of eyes that they can use. They just need to know who to report this information to. It is a partnership between everybody. It's not just the pest control team's responsibility to do the pest control. Everybody can be looking out. Everybody can be looking for these things and document them so that you have the records of what's going on and you can use that to tell you the story of what's going on. So with that, this is my information. I'm more than happy to, to talk to you um, if you're having some issues or just want to learn more about rodents or any type of pest control within the food industry. I'd be happy to talk to you about that. I know that we've had some questions pop up. I've seen the chat bar going. It's too fast for me to, to read through it. So I'm not ignoring you, I swear. Um, but Simon, where, where are we here? Let's let's start this. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, let's take the slides off. Okay. And then start with the question so the first one there from brenda <clears throat> non-toxic bait is just another oh, get rid of that just another food source that draws the rodents in we've opted for mechanical traps yeah so, and it can I, I mean brenda like i said you know it can be a food source but it's also a monitoring device so if you know that your populations are really low it's just that little bit that as soon as you see that that hit on it as soon as you see them start to feed on it you can then implement that. Um, but you're right, if you do have some heavier populations on the, on the outside, that does become a food source. And you know, just making sure that you have the right amount of traps and the right amount of coverage on the outside works great for your site. So keep doing that, you're absolutely right. Okay, uh, and for Leslie and anybody else, it is recorded today, so you get the recording and slides later to watch at your leisure. Uh, Catherine, Catherine, um, what would the bait not attract maggots and flies? Well, hope most of the bait, um, particularly again, I'll, I'll speak to the United States and Europe. Um, unless it gets wet, unless there's like this, it, it gets submerged in water, it should not be attractive to flies or maggots. However, we have had an issue here and there with it being attractive to ants. Um, so one of the things that you can do is you know, if you're having a problem with ants, you put down some ant bait too um, around those bait stations. And now you've dealt with your rodent problem and you've dealt with your ant problem. So maggots should not be an issue with the bait. If it is, it means it's getting wet and you need to replace it a lot more often then. Okay, thank you. Uh, quite a long question from Yolanda. Who is responsible for pest management in a mobile bottling contractor? unit is stationed at a client's premises the mobile bottling unit is four meters long what pest management other than visual inspection is the responsibility of the mobile bottling contractor wow um i don't know that i've ever heard of a mobile bottling contractor so i'd be interested to see some pictures um, of what you're dealing with um what i would say right off the bat is that if you can have any traps or or stations that can monitor help you monitor but you know, in that situation, maybe maybe what you have is just that visual inspection that you and your team have to do. So who's responsible for the pest management? I'm not quite sure. Um, that's something that you and the, the contractor would have to work out between the two of you. Okay, and uh, Richard, where can snap traps be used? Definitely not inside production areas? Um, I will say that, first of all, check your regulations. Um, if you do have uh, regulations in your country that, um, you know, are around snap traps, follow those. I would say you absolutely can use snap traps inside production areas, but think of where the rodents are gonna be. The rodents aren't gonna be like out in the middle of the floor, so you wouldn't put your snap traps there. You'd put them up against the wall where employees are not gonna be, because of course, when we talk about non-target organisms, humans are non-target organisms too. So we don't want any fingers or toes. So you wanna put them in those dark secluded areas where you can still service them, but the people aren't gonna come in contact with them, but it's still in rodent pathways. So think around those lines. Okay, and Kelly, just a bit of feedback. Always enjoy the webinars presented by Shell, such a great presenter and always provides some new and very useful information. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'd, I like this one. Uh, Ad Adewale, uh, is it permissible to use a cat to chase a rat in a food company? 
So um, that cat does the same thing that rodents do, and they do um, leave droppings and urine behind, and they have hairs that can contaminate. So I would not suggest it. Now, there are some cases um, in, in certain countries, the cats on the outside may provide a little bit of rodent control, but I would you know, really look at the sanitation and the exclusion first. And if you have a stray cat on the outside, okay. But on the inside, to me, that would be another contamination issue. Sure, and the audience uh, concur with a loud nose. Uh, <laughs> no Hanisa, uh, when using a rat glue board in production areas, is it necessary to put food on the glue boards to attract mice? Not, not <clears throat> necessary, but I would probably recommend it because otherwise that glue board is just static. You have to wait for the rodent to go there. If you put that little piece of food or something, it's that extra bit of attractiveness that will drive it to that glue board a little bit faster. So not necessary, but recommended. A couple more on cats. Alejandro, is it okay to have a few cats roam around the parking lot and employees? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, and also Catherine said agricultural areas could have cats if needed. Yeah, so. again, on the outside, but remember too, we, we have this problem in the United States that people have cats on the outside, but they still feed them. Yeah. So if you want them to eat the rodents, don't give them another food source because then they're having their pizza delivered to them and they're not going to go out and hunt for their pizza. So if you have cats on the outside, do not give them an extra food source. Make them go after the food source you want them to. Yeah. Uh, Michael, what are the steps in the implementation of an integrated pest management for a brewery? Inspection, sanitation, exclusion, monitoring, and pesticides. And of course, the, the teamwork. Um, if you have some specific questions and want to talk about your brewery, reach out to me and we'll talk about that. Okay, Hamid, sometimes there is evidence of the presence of rats despite the presence of traps as a result of placing them in the wrong places. Absolutely. That trap placement is key. Remember how those rodents are thinking. They're small. They're scared. So if you don't put the device in their pathway where they are, why would they go to it? When they can easily keep running in their pathway between their home and their food, the traps over here, you're absolutely right, they won't go to it. Okay, and uh, Sarah, what is the behavior of a field mouse? Do they choose to settle inside building or do they go back to the field and just pop in for a visit? Uh, is field mouse activity of a concern to a warehouse located next to a field? Yeah, so it, it depends. Uh, if they get inside and they find a nice safe spot to set up shop and to have their little family, they will absolutely stay inside. Um, if they have an easy access, like they're right by a door on the outside and it's easy for them to go back and forth, they may choose to do that. But yes, if you have a field, um, really any area that you're in, if it's urban, if it's agriculture, wherever you are, you have the chance of rodent issues, whether that's house mouse, field mouse, rats, wherever you are, it is a potential issue. Okay. And Mike, would you say vitamin D3 is effective as a rodenticide? We are an organic certified plant and have a few limitations when it comes to choosing types of rodenticides. Yeah, I would, I would check to see what you have available. Um, to your point, uh, organic, uh, if you're organic inside, you may not necessarily have to be organic outside. So we'd have to kind of find out a little bit more about what you're producing, what you're doing, and what your your standards are for that certification. So if you want to reach out to me after, I'd, I'd love to have that conversation with you. Okay. And Basma, what if I found small traces of what I don't know inside a cart and package and I cannot find anything else? Do we have to get rid of the whole quantity is a very large amount. Yeah, so if you if you find droppings inside, think of what your supplier is going to say. Think of what your standards are. Think of think of what your your government requirements may be for that. I would say that if you find evidence on a pallet slightly inside that pallet, to me that would be contaminated and I don't want to ship that to my customers. That would be my standard. Your standards? I don't know. Yeah. Um, Shadeen, uh, is it common for snails to eat bait? 
I have seen lots of snails in in stations. Um, they will eat it um, a little bit. Uh, I would say it's not all that common. And one of the things is snails are usually in those wet, overgrown areas. Maybe move that bait station a little bit to an area where it's it's better suited. Yeah, uh, Alaris, is there a way to determine if the eaten portion of baits was caused by rodents or other pests? You will usually see those those gnaw marks. They have those two big front teeth. So yeah. unless it's completely gone, in which case, well, you need to add some more bait then too. Um, you should see those gnaw marks if it's going to be rodents. Smaller ones for mice, bigger ones for rats. Okay. And uh, Ger Pete, uh, why are glue boards not permissible at some places? You know, what's the reason for that? There are some countries that that have. Um, you know, that no longer allow the use of glue boards because uh, there's issues, uh, they're, they're often considered inhumane. Uh, they they can catch anything. Uh, I've seen lizards, snakes, birds, lots of different things that get stuck on glue boards. So some countries have enacted regulations that prohibit the use of glue boards. Okay, and Oluwaisun, uh, I've been using bait boxes now for over a year and the rats or mice do not enter into the box. What can I do, please? Also, can traps be used inside processing facilities? So for the, the bait boxes, do you even have a problem? Um, you might have no rodents on the outside or very few. Uh, the other thing you can do is start shifting them around. Maybe they're not in a good place. Shift those bait boxes to a different location to see if you get additional feeding activity. And maybe change the bait in them too if you can. If you're using the same bait for a year, maybe it's time to switch that. And can we use traps inside? Absolutely. Just be very careful how you do it. Remember all the people, remember all the movement that's going on inside the facility when you place those. Okay, uh, Chizak, very interesting presentation, Ma. My question is, is there any alternative to rodent control apart from baiting trap setting, like some chemicals that can chase the rodents away and not necessarily trapping and killing them? So there are a few products that are considered repellents that are on the market. Uh, my own personal opinion is that I don't think they work extremely well. However, they can be beneficial in some areas. Uh, they usually don't work very well for, for long periods of time, which is why we use the bait because it holds up uh, for quite a while. Those, those repellents usually have to be reapplied very often in order to be effective. So um, not my first recommendation, but I have used them in some cases. Okay, and Dr. Ahmed, uh, in Vietnam, people eat rats. If there is a slaughterhouse for rats, can we apply a food safety management system on it? Absolutely. Why not? I mean, you want to keep the you want to keep the other non targets out. I mean, we may not be talking about rodents per se, but think of the insects, the flies, the maggots that that may be getting in there. So we want to keep, you know, if we're using the rat as a human food source, we want to keep that food source safe. So absolutely. Yes, sure. Uh, challenge PG, thank you very much for the enlightenment about the exclusion. How can you manage rodent entry in a warehouse where the door is always left open? Well, obviously you can't. Um, I would like to tell you to close the door, but we all know that sometimes that can't happen. So I would make sure there's lots of devices around that door so that if something does get in, there's lots of points that are going to catch it before it gets farther into that structure. So you know that's a hot spot, so really protect it with all the other devices that you have. Okay, and as if uh, we have been facing issues with rats hiding in the false ceiling, we're not able to put any glue pad or monitor the same. They are cutting AC wires, tubes, results in water, which results in water leakage. What do you suggest? Ugh, can you burn the building down? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, we probably want to try and get some type of trap up there. If you can't get glue boards, can we get snap traps up there or maybe do something to, um, to insulate those wires, um, put something on those wires so they can't chew through it or, or don't want to chew through it. Um, but that's a, that's a complicated one. I'd love to see some pictures of what you're dealing with. Okay. But Casey, as an auditor, when I see a bit of mold on a bait block, I think it's no longer any good, but the pest control companies say that it's not true. 
Is there any truth in what they say? Yeah, this is a great one. Thank you for this. Um, the manufacturers of bait, particularly the hard baits, not necessarily the soft baits, um, have found that even with a little mold, the bait is still palatable. So the rodents will still eat it. Personally, from a pest control standpoint, if it's been out there long enough to mold or there's enough water that's causing it to mold, I either want to move that bait station or put fresh bait in it. So technically, the mold is okay. Realistically, am I doing the best job I can with that bait in that box or should I do something a little differently to be more effective? Okay. And Abdul, can we say that plants around the food premises should be avoided? Especially large overgrown plants. If you want, you know, a nice little managed area, that's great. But you want that three foot, two to three foot, you know, one meter border around your facility that is vegetation free so that you can inspect that area so that rodents won't go there. Try and cut down that overgrown area if you can. Okay, thank you. And Hamid, uh, What's uh, effectiveness of ultrasonics in reducing rodents? Zero. Um, those products are on the market. They have been tested again and again and again scientifically, and they have been found to be completely ineffective. Don't use them. Okay. Three comments. Kiki, I just can't stop looking at the photo of the cockroach behind Shell. My kind of nightmare. Dennis, cats <laughs> have pretty strong negative impacts on the environment, wildlife. Also, if you care about that. Sandra. Birds. Yep especially yeah. sandra hip hip great presentation and delivery uh chizak uh plants and trees a good habitation of good health benefit how can such situation be handled when it become a habitat for rodents keeping it managed you know we don't want those overgrown wild areas but a nice neat garden um, trimmed back plants that are shrubs things like that as long as it's well managed you don't want it out of control you don't want overgrowth um, think like the rodent uh, if it's if it's big if it's messy if it's dark that's good for them so if we keep it trimmed back we keep those areas smaller that's really good Okay. Alaris, what examples of food bait are effective for rodents that can be used inside a food facility without possibly attracting other pests? Oh, I would be hesitant to use bait inside a facility because of the contamination issue. So I would look at other methods like trapping and monitoring um, exclusion first. Um, but if you need to uh, contact me later, we'll see what you have available in your area and we can talk about that. Okay, and Ziad, should we be afraid of dogs eating rodenticide? We get asked a lot. Yeah, I mean, we don't want anything but the rodent to eat the rodenticide. That's the point. And so that's why we want to contain it inside those bait stations. We want to make sure they're locked, they're secured, so that no other animals can get in to eat that. Okay, Nandish, uh, any recent innovations and effective tools to avoid rodents and other? I'm sure one of the new tools that has come onto the market is electronic monitoring so that when a rodent goes into a station, into a trap, it sends an alert, your cell phone, your email, whatever it is, gets that alert and you can go directly there right then. You don't have to wait until next week when you check those traps. You get an alert right away when that happens. And that's pretty exciting because then we can solve those problems faster again when they're really small and easy to deal with versus when they're really big. Good idea. Uh, Mohammed. Uh, can rodents become immune to rodenticides? Is it necessary to change them periodically? Yes. So there is evidence of resistance to the active ingredients in rodenticides. So I would periodically change those rodenticides. Uh, if you have low pressure, about once a year would probably be okay. If you have high rodent pressure, you may want to think about every six months. Okay. Uh, pigeons in the rafters. Oh no, what do we do? Um, in the <laughs> uh, try and keep them out. Uh, you can net them, you can trap them. There are pigeon traps. Um, you can, you know, hand net them. There are mist nets that you can hang up to, <clears throat> to capture them. Um, and there are some more harsh methods uh, if you have the, the means to that, but start, sure. start thinking about keeping them out. Okay, prevention is better than shotgun. Oh, yes. Uh, Gurpri, are there any chemical rodenticides approved by FDA to use in food companies? 
I'm not sure about the FDA specifically, but the EPA regulates our rodenticides and there's not any rodenticide I know that prohibits the use of them inside. It's just we typically don't do that because of the potential for contamination, but it is technically allowed. Okay, good. Uh, Muffa, in, if, in case I did not check on time my rodent box, how much time taken mice or rat is dead? Sure, they usually need a couple feedings. You know, they feed little tiny bits at a time, so two, three feedings, and then they're gonna go off into their little home and two to three days later, depending on the type of bait you're using, two to three days and they'll be dead after eating that bait. Okay, and how uh, can we fight against bees in a juice company? Oh, reach out to me after on that one. That's that's a longer discussion. So um, feel free to, to email me on that one. Okay. And Sandra, uh, in, in the UK, some areas demonstrate rodent resistance to commonly available rodent size. Check with your approved expert. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, and Emmanuel, uh, rat mats may be good for places where doors are constantly open. Potentially, yeah. Again, glue boards, traps, you know, you know that that's a hot spot area. So do what you can to protect it with the other devices that you have. Okay. And Arthur's asking about, uh, can you comment on the effectiveness of rodent fertility control? Yep, it is a product that we have in the United States. Um, in lab tests, it was proven to be very effective in the lab. Um, there are complications when you bring it out into the field, along with other food, other water sources, and um, having them feed on that daily can be a challenge. So, Arthur, if you want to learn more about that, I'd be happy to talk more about that offline. Okay, Laura, am I able to climb up warehouse racking and nesting bins up high? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Ian. Uh, Ian, Ian, Ian. Are you taking the tails from rats to test for resistance to rodenticide in your country once caught? Huh? Um, I believe there might be one or two people that are doing that. It is not widespread. Okay. And I'm dropping my email back in the chat box there for anybody who needs it. Okay, we've just got two or three more questions now. Mackenzie, okay. how long would you recommend that we can leave mouse paste bait down, something I see pest controllers using more? Until it's not fresh. Um, you know, conditions are going to differ across the U.S., across Europe, wherever you are. So once it loses its freshness, once it loses its its gel, uh, I would suggest replacing it. Okay, and Pranab, uh, we are using three defense line rodent control, but, it's, but still rodents uh, are not under control. Please suggest what to do. Um, if you can, show me, uh, give me the address of your site, show me some pictures, and maybe I can help you troubleshoot that a lot, but I'd need a lot more information. Okay, sure. Angel, how often, uh, how often should we conduct pest control in food, food production per week? Uh, every single day you have how many employees that are out there you 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 are technically doing an inspection every single day how often should you check your devices um, that's a conversation to have with your pest control provider to see what your pressures are and and what would be best for your particular facility and uh, the last one I think Ryan if you catch a mouse in a trap what should you do with the mouse um, you should dispose of it properly according to the regulations that exist in your area. Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> okay, uh, and then a few thank yous. Uh, so, yeah, you've got Shell's email. Is it actually on the presentation as well on the last slide? Yes, it's on the, it's on the last slide. I'm also on LinkedIn. Uh, you can visit my website. Um, there's plenty of ways to get in touch with me. So feel, feel free to, to shoot me an email, shoot me a message on LinkedIn. Happy to talk with you. Super. Right. Brilliant. And uh, we've got Shell, I think, is it the 9th or the 11th of November? Uh, December? 9th? 9th, 9th of November. Yeah. We're doing a four hour uh, pest control one, much more in depth. So, um, yeah. So, thanks everybody for attending. Thanks, Shell, for that. Great as usual. Um, super. Really enjoyed it. Loads of questions. Did you enjoy it, Shell? I, I always enjoy this. I love talking about this stuff, it's fun for me.
Yeah. And I, I, as Shell, you know, said, if you want to reach out to her on her email, give her more information about your specific problem. Happy to help. Super. Right. Have a great weekend, Shell. Take care. Bye, folks. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Take care. See you next week. Bye.